Uh, for evolution, what is it called when a species uh, diverges and makes two new species? What's that called? Split. Speciation. Okay, um, making a species is called speciation. All right. So speciation is a process in which new species develop from pre-existing species. Okay. Um, so that is a form of evolution. Um, but if a new species is formed, we call it speciation. Okay. Evolution is the change of something over time. Um, to do what for that organism or for that kind of species? Why do things change? To evolve. Um, to better fit your environment is going to be called evolution. So how do those um, little adaptations even happen in an organism? Mutations. Mutations, good. And um, are mutations random or are they caused by the environment? Random. They are random, okay? Mutations are random. If that mutation is good for that organism, helps it be more fit in its environment, then it is passed on from one generation to the next. And then there may be slight mutations in that mutation that cause it to be better. And so we didn't automatically get from a dinosaur to a bird in one generation. It happened over a long period of time with little mutations to that adaptation over time where we had some feathers, we had a lot of feathers, then we had extensions of those feathers and then um, eventually we got to um, some hollowed out bones and the structure of a bird that we have today. If you look at a reptile skeleton, um, like a, an extinct dinosaur and a chicken skeleton, they look very similar to each other. It's kind of creepy, yes. So remember the phylogeny? Do you remember that phylogenetic tree where we had one common ancestor? and then it branched off into all those things and humans and dogs and horses were on this side and then bacteria were like way down on the left side, okay? So we all have a common ancestor but how far um, we've come from that ancestor is during that breaking. And remember, that's called diverging evolution. When you break apart, what's it called when you come together? Converging. Converging evolution. And what about when they evolve at the same time? Co-evolution. Well, Okay, co-evolution is when they go up, when they go side by side. So co-evolution would be like a hummingbird and the trumpet flower. So the trumpet flower is shaped just for the hummingbird. Okay, the hummingbird's um, mouth or beak is shaped just for that certain um, flower. Okay, so um, anyway. Um, true or false? There are always enough resources to support all organisms. False. That is definitely false. Um, what happens when there's not enough resources for organisms? They, they die off. Okay, they could die off. What else do they do to they, what else do they do to each other? They compete with one another for resources. And then the one that doesn't get the resource normally dies. Okay? So um, what happens to a species that have the advantageous trait? So if something uh, if they have a mutation and it's good for it, what ends up happening? It's more fit, which means, what does it mean to be fit? Survive to breed and pass, <laughs> pass on. I was waiting for you to keep on going. And pass on its genes to the next generation, all right? So live long enough to reproduce, to be able to have viable offspring, which are the babies having babies, okay? babies that can have babies. All right, um, so what happens to the species that doesn't have it? Yeah, they Sorry. usually die in some way, shape, or form. Um, either they starve to death because they can't compete for the resources, um, or they're picked off by a predator if they can't be camouflaged, all right? Um, or if they're slow or something like that. Um, what was the difference between Lamarck and Darwin's theories of evolution? So what did Lamarck say? What was his deal? If you cut off your toe accidentally or maybe on purpose for some reason, um, then your child would be born without that toe as well because you modified your body in order for, I don't know, something happened, okay? Um, same thing, bless you. Could be like if you got a tattoo, then your baby would be born with the same tattoo and like really small on his arm. Says mom <laughs> on it or something, huh? Yeah, that'd be kind of crazy. What if you had like the whole body tattoo? Your baby came out like, wah! Um, <laughs> probably would. 
Um, anyway, so Lamarck, Lamarck said that, and he also said that um, organisms will get that, uh, that adaptation in one lifetime. So remember the giraffes um, example? He said that if a giraffe really, really, really wanted that leaf on the top of that tree, it could stretch its neck, and because it stretched its neck through its life, then its uh, offspring would have a stretch neck as well. Now, you guys know, if you chop off your toe, your baby's still gonna be born with a toe, okay? Um, animals cannot, or organisms cannot modify themselves in one uh, generation, and they can't be like, hmm, you know what? I need a longer neck, and grow their neck. Um, that's all random mutation. Mutation has to happen in order for that to actually go through. And about Darwin, Darwin said that uh, those mutations happen over time. So it can't happen in one generation, it has to happen over multiple generations. And that even if you cut off your toe, it's not like you're losing any of your DNA. You're not losing that DNA to create a toe, all right? So um, it's, it's still passed on from one generation to the next. But think about the finches that Darwin uh, collected on the Galapagos Islands. What did he find? Why were all the finches different than one another? What, what they eat, right? So they evolved to fit their environment or their mutations were more advantageous to a certain environment so they got that beak shape. So um, we ended up getting a beak that was for crushing nuts and seeds. We got a beak that was for um, insects. We got a crow bean beak. Um, all these different beak shapes based on the type of food that they eat. And um, remember, we call that a niche. So um, if you take a uh, seed cracking bird and you put it on an island where there's no seeds but there's cacti, it's not going to survive very well there because that's not its niche. That's not its job. Its job is to crack seeds. Um, but it's not going to survive in that environment because that mutation wasn't selected for in that environment. So do you guys remember what that selection process is called? Natural, Natural selection. So the environment, it's not like the environment's like, oh, no, you're going to go away, you're going to go away, you're going to go away, you're going to stay. It's just whatever is more advantageous to that area is going to be able to be passed on to the next generation, next generation hopefully is going to be better, and so on and so forth. So remember the rock pocket mouse video we watched? Yes, yeah. When there was a uh, mouse that had a mutation with its coloring, and there was lava flows, and then there was also sand areas, and on the lava flows, almost all of the mice that were on that lava flow, that were caught in that lava flow, were dark, because that mutation was good for them. If a mouse of a different color of sand, that sandy color came up onto the lava rock, then what happened? They got picked out because it wasn't camouflaged anymore. But same thing would happen if the dark mouse went on the sand, then it would be picked off. So fitness depends on the environment that you're in, okay? Three different types of isolating mechanisms. There's actually four that we talked about. Think about um, the species of birds, the bird video that we watched and the island and how the main, there was a population on the main island and it came over to the actual island, the one that we were talking about. What happened to divide those two species from one another or the multiple species from one another? What's the mainland versus the island? What kind of island? Island. <laughs> What's the mainland versus the island uh, called? What kind of isolation is that? Geographic isolation, good job. Geographic isolation, mechanical isolation. What is mechanical isolation? <laughs> Square peg, round hole, remember? <laughs> okay, um, the sperm and the egg don't go together. Or there's some other way, something has changed so much that the, <laughs> the organs don't work well together. Okay, they don't work right together. Okay. Or this is like if a dog and a cat did it, okay? Dog sperm and cat eggs don't go together and vice versa. They just, they're so different from one another that they can't have a living embryo. They can't have a zygote. It'll never happen, all right? But 
What you were saying, Madison, was behavioral isolation. So what were you talking about? She's talking about the Birds of Paradise videos that we watch. And if the female likes the male's dance or likes his courtship, whatever he's doing, so the one was building a, like building some kind of arch or something out of sticks, um, the female will pick the one that she likes the best. Now, um, remember, all of those different dances were really different from one another. And, um, and the birds look very different from one another again. But remember, they had a common ancestor that kind of looked like a crow and had all those different colors and all those different sizes and variations came from that over a long period of time. Okay, so that's behavioral isolation. The last isolation is temporal isolation. Do you guys know what temporal isolation is? Yeah. It has to do with the timing of when they're, um, when they're breeding with each other. So one species of bird could breed, let's say in April and May, and another species of bird may breed in June or July. So they don't ever cross mate with each other. Um, also there's nocturnal individuals. So what does nocturnal mean? During, during the night and diurnal is during the day. Okay, diurnal is during the day. What are the two types of genetic drift that we have? Bottleneck is one, yep. And what's the other one? Founder effect, okay? So, um, remember, genetic drift means that we are taking the genetics of one population, um, making it very, very small, making a small gene pool, and then making a population out of that small gene pool. So. Um, bottleneck effect means that there was some kind of disaster, something happened to the general population. So I think I talked to you guys about the Black Plague yep. and taking out 70% of Europe, yep. all right? And then 30% of Europe was left over. Either they had some kind of mutation that caused them not to get the plague or they were really, really smart and avoided it somehow. Um, so that population, smaller gene pool, only 30% of the 100% of the original, then um, was able to repopulate Europe. The founder effect is when you take a small population from a large population and completely geographically isolate it from something else. So this would be like the iguanas that got onto the Galapagos Islands. That's founder effect, so maybe they were washed there on some storm debris. Number eight on here, evidence of evolution. We have fossils, homologous structure, analogous structure, embryology, and biochemistry. So uh, fossils, you guys know we can compare fossils depending on where we find them in the rock. Remember, the more recent fossils are at the top and the um, older fossils are at the bottom. So depending on the types of rock and the types of soil that you're finding them in, um, we'll tell you how old they are, what kind of era they came from, and then you can compare those skeletons or those remains of one fossil to another to kind of see how it has evolved over time. Homologous structures are similar structures but different organisms. So this is like a whale's fin, a bat's wing, a human's hand. Um, they all, we all came from a similar common ancestor. We're all mammals. But um, the bones have elongated, have mutated to fit, um, to fit that organism. Analogous structure is the same structure but have completely evolved separately from each other but have the same function. So this is a butterfly's wing, a bird's wing, and a bat's wing. So a butterfly's wing is made out of um, like exoskeleton material. Um, different kinds of proteins, not bones. Analogous structure is the same function, but different structure. So that's what I was saying, like a butterfly wing doesn't have bones in it. A bat's wing is uh, structured differently than a bird's wing. Bird skeletons are hollow, bats are not, all right? They're just really small. Um, embryology, that has to do with the study of embryos. Remember, most embryos, look very similar to each other the first couple of days of conception. They all look like little tadpoles. And then as they grow, you start to see differences in them. And you can see which ones develop more closely together probably are more closely related to each other. So um, in the picture that I showed you guys, we had the salamander and the fish, right? They're more closely related than the pig and the person, the pig and the person are more closely related to each other, okay? Um, and then biochemistry, that's DNA, all right? DNA means 
every living thing has DNA, depending on how many differences there are, depends on how closely you're related. So we and chimpanzees are very closely related because our DNA is close together, but there still are mutations. That's why we're different species. Um, you can talk about like squirrels and mice and rats. They're all very similar to each other. They're all rodents, but they have some differences that cause them to be different species from one another. Gradual evolution and punctua punctuated equilibrium. Remember I showed you a chart and then I had a line and said that things evolve over time. So as time increases, so does evolution. Um, but we've noticed that, you guys remember the mass extinction events we were, I was showing you? I showed you like a picture of that, mass extinction events. Yeah. And then I said, there was, a, there was a bunch of death and destruction, so that's when evolution happened. And then there was kind of like a plateau when there was the good times. Everything was all good, there was enough resources. And then more death and destruction and evolution occurred. There was another boom in evolution. And then everything was good again, and then up and over and up and over. That punctuated equilibrium is when it goes up and plateaus and up and plateaus. Yeah. All right, last thing. Give um, an example of selective breeding, inbreeding, and hybridization. They kind of all go together, but what's the difference between all of them? So what is selective breeding? So yeah, like breeding dogs. So what did we do when, or you talk about the foxes, remember the silver foxes that we watched that video on? What did they breed for in those silver foxes? Uh, being nice. Being nice, their behavior, so being more tame or docile. So they took the pups that were more docile and then they bred them together and then chose only the pups that were more docile from that and then bred them together. You guys remember the video I showed you with the um, 10 different fruits and vegetables that were different and then, okay. Um, yeah, definitely the avocado, uh, what else was there? Corn, tomatoes, strawberries. So that's banana, selective breeding. Okay, selective bleeding. Selective breeding for that type of fruit or vegetable because we wanted them to be bigger. We wanted them to be better. We wanted them to taste good. Um, so we selectively bred them. But it goes along with letter B, which is inbreeding. So again, we talked about dog breeds, how we selectively bred them. So someone talked about a pug, and uh, I uh, thought about golden retrievers. Um, golden retrievers. If you breed a golden retriever and a golden retriever together, what will you get? A golden German retriever. Shepherd. No, not a German Shepherd. A golden retriever. Um, we have bred out all of the diversity of that group. So um, that's why you get golden retrievers if you breed two of them together because we've gotten to the point where we take puppies from the same litter and then they would breed them so that they would have the same traits. You're not gonna get like a mutt out of, out of that breeding. So uh, that's why we do inbreeding. And then hybridization, what's hybridization? Horses. Donkeys and horses. horses that make mules, okay? Donkeys and horses don't naturally occur next to each other in the wild. And so people have put them together and then they do their thing and you get a mule. Now a mule, cannot breed other mules because they are sterile. Most hybrid hybrids um, are sterile. You also have ligers, which are tigers and lions put together. Okay, ligers, tigers, and lions. Anyway, that's it for this, for evolution.